This is it, people. This is what you've been waiting for. This is Everyday Celebrity Podcast. The podcast where everyday people with everyday problems trying to find everyday solutions to accomplish everyday goals. Let's start the show. You, 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 welcome to another episode of Everyday Celebrity Podcast. This is your host, your number one host in the Bay Area, Jordan Owandi. Um, today, we have a special guest, like we always do. This woman has been, I think she's an Oakland native, but we'll find out. But she took happy hour, virtual happy hour, to the next level. She goes by the name of Taylor Brown. Welcome to the show. Hello. <laughs> Thank you for having me. All right. How are you doing today? Uh, I mean, I feel weird saying I'm good right now with everything going on politically, but I think saying that's important too and uh-huh. like maintaining that level of energy is important. So I've been saying I'm good, even though there's like that tinge of guilt. So how do you really feel? You I can, mean, you can be honest on the show. There's, I'm obviously like dealing with the emotional strain of like being a black woman in America and seeing and responding to everything going on. Mm-hmm. I've also chosen to fight the fight more peacefully and more introspectively this time around. Um, in my younger years, like particularly when I was at Berkeley High and I had that like, I don't give a fuck mentality and I was on BSU. I did a lot of like really radical, dangerous protesting that my parents were like, I mean, they were happy about my passion, but really Mm. uncomfortable with me going out there to like the Oscar Grant protest. So I've kind of like come to a point now where I when I was younger, I didn't believe peaceful protest was viable. I I do at this point in my life. Mm. So I've been like mostly doing like signing petitions, donating, yeah. um, cooking up. I've been seeing a lot of artists just do like online raffles and donating the proceeds. So I'm kind of like cooking up what I could do in that vein mm-hmm. and, and taking that route to channel my emotions. Mm-hmm. So... I do feel good taking that route. And so I think that's why I've been telling people, you know, I feel good. Cause usually yeah. when I ask people nowadays, how are you? It's, it, they're not good. So. Yeah. Do you think, uh, violent and radical protests are necessary? Honestly, I do. Even though I'm taking a different stance in my personal life. Yeah. Um, and I think I, I've just always felt like even though there's I, there's a place for both in, in my mind. Like I kind of think the violent and the radical actions are what get it rolling. And then it gets finished off with the peaceful actions. Kind of yeah. like when we look at the duality between Malcolm X in his early years versus like how he ended up more calm in his later years mm-hmm. and choosing to be more peaceful in his later years. So I think that you need both. And as much as like it kind of like was like, even though I'm, I'm really, I'm on team fuck cops. I kind of like was sick to my stomach seeing the cars burning because that's still a human being. Yeah. And so, I mean, well, there weren't human beings in the fucking cars. <laughs> it was the thought that is getting violent to the extent that, like, anyone in the area could be injured by that burning car exploding. Yeah. So, I mean, it kind of where I am now. I'm very sensitive to the violence, but I, I do think there, there's a place for it, and like, I definitely think it, it's eye opening for these like wealthy white people making decisions. Yeah. Like, uh, like, oh, some peaceful protesters sitting down. That doesn't make them turn their head. Hmm. If we're being honest, like, yeah. though I wish it did, and that's all it took, mm-hmm. those cop cars on fire did. Now they're shaking in their boots. Do you think, but do you think things are actually going to change? Because if you look at the news lately, right, and if you, if you, were, if you were watching these protests, you would, see, you would see some cops who were, like, hugging people, hugging protesters, kneeling with protesters. And I couldn't stand that. I couldn't stand watching that because I can't stand when these black people are going up to these cops 
shaking their hands, hugging them. I'm like, oh, we just want you to march with us. These motherfuckers don't give a shit about you. Yeah. These same cops that are kneeling next to you just for a photo op are going to be tear gassing you and hitting you an hour later. And then they just had this one cop in the news today saying that he uh, he sent an email to his department apologizing to his department because he kneeled with uh, the fucking protesters and See? it got out. It was on TV. He and he, he sent an apology to all the cops in his department. He said, "Oh, I'm sorry for kneeling. I shouldn't have done that. It was it was embarrassing." Wow. So these motherfuckers smile in your face and will stab you in the black. I think it's time. Well, this is my view. I'm like an extremist when it comes to like I'm like a ba- black extremist, and I think it's I think violence. I'm not talking about killing people, but I think violence is very necessary. I think black people. I'm all about what Mar- Malcolm X was preaching back in the day about like an eye for an eye. We need to protect arm and protect ourselves because you black people need to stop walking around thinking that the white mentality is going to change. Yeah, like. I'm torn. For me, this is the first time in my short lifetime that I'm actually seeing things that weren't even happening. For me, Oscar Grant protests were my first really opportunity I felt like as a youth to get out there and make a stance. And since then, we've seen nothing but killing after killing after killing after killing and cops just not being held accountable or being arrested or whatever else. Uh, yeah. And this is the first time I'm seeing s- just very small change being made. Like today, I think it's in St. Louis, they were able to pass the Breonna Taylor law, mm-hmm. which repealed the, or it didn't actually repeal it, which is what I thought it was going to do. But I got, Yeah, it got a unanimous vote. Yes, it amended so. it. Mm-hmm. Um, and so they have to look back into it, reopen it, et cetera, and kind of revamp that whole no knock. But situation. that's just in Kentucky, though. That's a victory I never thought we'd see, I guess, is my point. And it's the type that I would be like, fuck that in the past. That's nothing. We need more. But mm-hmm. um, I'm also reminding myself that we've never even seen that tiny budge in the past and that this these protests still aren't over. It's, this is yeah. an ongoing process. So we've already got an officer in custody, which people were mad about that because we wanted four in custody for George Floyd and we got one, but it's like, we got the one just from protesting. So that's a sign, you know, our protesting is yielding results. Mm-hmm. And then we've got the Breonna Taylor law passed. We got, we, they, there's four, four of them, all four. All of them got four arrested. now. Okay. You didn't know that? I'm actually, I'm taking it to like where I check the, I, I just like binge the media twice a week. Yeah, all four of them are arrested. Okay. But, one one is released on bail right now. Oh, that's horrible. Okay, see, yeah. Friday, I would have done my next binge tomorrow. <laughs> so, and I'm doing this purposely because I was one of those people incessantly checking like every 30 minutes yeah. and it was just really affecting my mental health doing that. So mm-hmm. what I'm doing now is I'm getting stuff by word of mouth in between my, my little news binges that I do twice a week. Yeah. So I do one at the beginning, one at the end of the week. And then... In between, I'm just talking to people mm-hmm. and getting my information that way. And I think that's a valid way to get it. And it's a less like stressful way to get it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, that's cool to do, but always, I forgot who said that, but who said this quote, but don't trust anyone's information, but your own. Like, Fair people, enough. people can tell you anything, but it's up to you to like f- seek out the truth, your own truth. And also, about the Breonna Taylor law. I mean, even though that shit passed, right? I mean, do you honestly think uh, cops are not going to do that? Because the chokeholds, for example, these cops are killing black men, uh, choking the shit out of them, and they're doing an illegal chokehold. That's illegal. Yeah. But they can, every fucking cop is doing it, and none of them, just like the dude in uh, New York who was selling those cigarettes, they killed them by doing an illegal chokehold. And it's illegal in the play. It's like illegal. Everyone knows it's illegal. They went to court and then they were found not guilty. So, I mean, these fucking laws when it comes to police officers don't mean shit. That's why they continue to do what they do, because they know deep down inside that they're going to get away with this shit. It's been happening since the fucking police were created. Yeah, that's Uh why uh, that's what gets me mad. And that's what I think people need to start fighting back. I'm allowing myself to hope this time around because, like I said, I'm seeing the small victories that I would have normally brushed off. Yeah. 
but at least I'm seeing something. And so that's allowing me to think, okay, maybe there's something there. The other thing I used to brush off in my past too is like the the justice system. I'm like, it's corrupt. Fuck it. Yeah. It's not, that's not it. I mean, so for me, if I'm being realistic with myself, let's say hypothetically best situation possible, we actually convince the U.S. to abolish the police system. That means we're going to have to develop a new system and put it in its place. If continuing down this thread of best case scenario, let's we're doing this hypothetically, then like we're going to have to to create laws which enforce this new this new whatever system we're putting in place of the police. So we can't run away from the justice system because we know it's corrupt. Mm-hmm. Because we know it's corrupt, we've got to confront it. I feel like just the same way we're we're protesting, we've got to get in there on all levels. So for me, like I'm not going to brush off any legal change we make just because I, I'm like triggered from from my past as an African American, my shared past as an African American. Like yeah. I definitely vibe with what you're saying about like, yeah, right. Are they going to listen? And that's the thing I'm trying to quiet in my own mind. It's like, maybe they will, maybe they won't, but this is step one. We're not done. Mm -hmm. We don't know what they're going to do till, till we flesh this all the way out Uh until we see it through. So, and we're going to have to eventually, if they start actually listening to our protest demands, a huge portion of the demands are revamping the legal system. So we're going to have to deal with laws and we're going to have to deal with them on, on good faith. Like you've heard us, you're revamping this. We've, we've got to believe and put some trust there because mm-hmm. we can't just change the laws and say, well, they're not going to listen. So we did all this work and changed them for nothing. Yeah. We got to believe our efforts mean something. So are you biracial? I'm not biracial. Um, my heritage is Creole. My family's ultimately from a plantation where they can trace it back to the slave master having an affair with a slave. And then because he was French versus British, um, and they had a different slavery system in which they fetishized the black woman and her like mulatto children. They gave a classification to their mixed children, Creoles. They taught them language, educated them, sent them to France, et cetera. Mm. And so being a descendant of a Creole, I guess, is like it's been fetishized in media, particularly like being light skin and rap songs or whatever. But at the end of the day, it's not something to be fetishized of. And it's something that I think coming from a Creole household, like we take very seriously that we're the product of slavery. And we use that as a motivator, I think, in Creole households to try to be the best person we can be um, to better show like different sides of blackness and what blackness means. And that it's not this stagnant picture, but um, mm-hmm. definitely being the lightest in my family. That's one of the most common questions I get. And I often choose to just say I'm black. I'm just light skinned because I think when you explain that you're Creel to someone, it has this connotation of that whole like fetishized element. And people don't realize, you know, like being Creole meant you weren't legally allowed to associate with blacks or whites. You literally had to live in designated areas, almost camp. They weren't camp like in the sense that they were well furnished, but like you're segregated into a specific block and area. You're segregated into a ghetto. So it's been this experience where you weren't historically, where you weren't black enough or you weren't white enough. And you're like this, you're this mulatto, you're this mutt left to your, you're stuck, you're a gray. And they also didn't even have legal status till a couple decades ago. You weren't, you didn't qualify as a person. <laughs> so it's this whole thing where you're like, you you might come off as like this sedity light skin girl, like I'm Creole when you're actually saying a lot more of a culturally and historically, char- it's a more historically and culturally charged comment than people are realizing. So for me personally, or you mix this comment, and I typically choose to just answer, unless I have the opportunity to explain what Creole means, I choose to just answer, I'm black, I'm just light skin. Because it's just got this, and I'm not sure what. Why do you have to throw the light skin? Why don't you just well, say I'm black? I throw that because they seem a little confused still as to, stuck on the skin Who color. seems confused? Not honestly, black people. Honestly, in the, I'd say black people less. But even black people, depending on like where they're from, like, I mean, I think you told me you were from the East Coast. Mm -hmm. I think there's a lot better understanding on the East Coast and in the South of how different 
black people can be within and all still be black. Yeah. But here on the West Coast, uh, we were like founded later and industrialized later and all this stuff. It was the Wild West. So we don't have the same history and legacy of black culture out here, mm-hmm. minus the Panthers. And so I find that African Americans out here are typically less educated about their history than others. So skin for me being like becomes a major issue when I talk to less um, aware black people living in the Bay area, I think it's gotten significantly better with what's going on politically because it's caused people to educate themselves. Yeah. Did you do your ancestry? Like your uh, ancestry.com and all that shit? Or is my this, dad did one of those. Or your dad, or did you just learn all this from your like grandparents or something? Your family history? Mostly word of mouth. Mostly like word of mouth, photos we have, and then my father's family has some of the older family members still living in Louisiana, really want to kind of have like their family story recorded in Louisiana history. So they've yeah. started a web page. They've gotten some of their family sites included on like historic tours. So I got a lot of information going to family reunion and like visiting where my family still lives and what's going on with them. Mm. Okay. What would you do if your family, uh, what would you do, what would your family do if you brought home a white man saying I'm marrying him? I think they would have opinions they do not vocalize. I think they would just be quiet about it and never say two words because they try really hard to be like woke and open minded. And they definitely uh, have, you know, they have white friends. I have white friends. So I think they would try to be progressive. But Mm -hmm. I also know that it would definitely, I think they'd be happy as long as anyone I bring home is respectful and making me happy. But there's a part of them that would like to see me with a black man. Would you ever marry a white man? I would. I would marry if I'm going to, I'm not big on marriage personally. So if I took it that far, I'd I'd have to be in love with someone. And I think when you're in love, you don't care about things so like So you date race. outside your race? I do date outside my race, yeah. yeah there's nothing to be ashamed of. <laughs> no, I mean, I felt <laughs> you like... You all hesitant and shit. I just felt like there's going to be another question coming, <laughs> but I'm ready. I'll feel, the, I'll feel the dating outside your race questions. I don't, I'm like cool with it. Okay. I really, I don't think that interferes with my capacity to be, you know, proud of myself as a black woman, proud of my heritage or an activist. Mm. And I don't think love, I think love is something that's broken boundaries. Like when we look at the court case, loving versus loving. Oh, that was bullshit. But the point is, people love each other, and it's and it's well documented. We wouldn't if have. If you were a kids. black woman back in those fucking days, and you did, you married a, and you thought a white man could give you everything that you needed, you were fucking tripping. Back in those days, when every single white person was a devil. Hey, hey, we weren't and there. You fall in we love weren't with there. A, a or white what about man? that Fuck African prince who married the Australian woman? I did not watch what that movie, movie because it looked like crap to me. What movie it might are you be a good about? movie. Should I Google it? Yes, you should Google so it. So it, it's played by the guy that also played Martin Luther King, the British actor. The dude who, who that was in Selma? Yes. He's he stars um, the he but apparently it's based on a true story and everyone's telling me to watch it. It did not look good, so I did not watch King it. African King married a, a white woman. Yes, Australian. And uh, there's a book about it. There's a novel, and then there's the film, and then uh, you know it was a big scandal. Yeah, I, I, I but never heard, I never heard they they to their dying. But Africans, I mean uh, Africans, they think marrying white people are uh, you. It's like I don't gold. know what they're like, on. They're like, oh, I need a white. I need a white person of. It's like a status symbol out mm. there. I don't know. They so the, I brought that up. I'm not an expert on his story. That's why I'm like googling him. But I brought that up because they, to their dying day, they really, really, really spent their time as a couple trying to convince. Well, I don't think they had to, and maybe that maybe makes people doubt him. But yeah. they really wanted to prove this was a love match. We've chosen each other for love. We are in love, and that was extremely important to them. Yeah. And so that's why I brought that up. I yeah. definitely think that there are plenty of like interracial marriages that have progressed thought. Maybe not at the time. Maybe they were persecuted at the time. But like nowadays, because of their efforts, that's something we see breaking. Like dating is the way I think we see people breaking racial boundaries. Because like if you're intimate with someone of a different race, you're going to have to like 
challenge the ugly parts of it. You're going to have to challenge your bias. You're going to have to challenge their bias. You guys are going to have to have hard conversations. I mean, that's all good and fine and dandy, but I have no problem with interracial dating. I have no problem with black men marrying white women or vice versa or Chinese, black, whatever, whatever mix you like. I have no problem with that. The only thing that I say about it is, let's say you marry a white, a black man marries a white woman, right? Yeah. And they're married 10 plus years and she can be like, oh, I love this man. I, he's black. I don't see color or anything. Now let's say you, you're driving, right? They get pulled over by the police. They're driving through Alabama or some shit. They're from New York, but they're driving to Alabama. They get into Alabama. To visit friends. They get pulled over by racist cops. And then he takes the black man out the car. Basically, they pulled him over racial profiling in a fancy car with a white woman. And they're in a, like, they're in, they're in a small town in Alabama in the outskirts, right? He gets pulled over, pulled out the car, gets fucked with. Uh, he probably gets hit in the stomach a couple times or whatever. Basically, racial profiling. But he doesn't die. It's back in the car. They go about their ways. Now he's pissed off, driving. He's he's dri- he's still driving to their friends' house. He's pissed, yelling and shit. And she's no matter of fact, he's not yelling because he knows that this is the life of, of a black man in America, racist America. Yeah. But she's yelling. She's even more madder than he is. She's like, oh, what the fuck? These motherfucking racist cops, blah, blah, blah. How the fuck they go pull you over? I don't understand why they pulled us over. Why would they do that? I don't understand this. And he's like, what the fuck you mean you don't understand this? It's America. You're white, I'm black. That's why he pulled us over. But she was like, well, he, they shouldn't have pulled us over. They need to be fired and all this other stuff. So basically what I'm saying is you can marry this white woman, mm-hmm. be in love and everything. But that white woman would never understand what a black man goes through. That white woman would never understand a black person's struggle, whether you're a black man or a white or a black woman. And if you have kids, how can you expect a white woman to teach a black? Because even though this this kid, this this little girl is mixed. Society is going to consider her a black woman, not mixed. They're not. Oh, you're mixed with white. We're going to treat you different. No, they're going to. You're you're black. Well, what mix? What mixed person? I'm pretty sure you know mixed people, right? Yeah. So, what out of your mixed friends do they ever say, "Oh, I'm mixed," or do they just say, "I'm black"? They say they're black. Exactly. But I think. Wait, wait, let me finish. <laughs> <laughs> so, society is going to think of them, consider them black. Now, how do you expect a white woman? who doesn't know shit about the black struggle in America to teach this black child about how to be a black woman in America. That's my only thing about yeah. uh, interracial dating. I Just mean... Because a lot of black people, when they marry outside their race, which there's no problem with, but a lot of them are blind and uh, ignorant to the fact that your spouse will never understand you. She might say she is. She might pretend like she's woke. But she will never understand your fucking struggle as a black person in America. Now, if you marry a black woman, now that's a, that's a, that's a bond that's, that's, that, only, that's, that you can't get anywhere else because you're both black. A black woman will know how to comfort you as a black man. Black woman will know what the fuck to do because she knows what it, how it is. So that's a bond that will, you will never have with your white sp- spouse. Your, Fair enough. Your, your thoughts on that? I mean, honestly, I think that that's a valid concern when dating outside your race and knowing that the ultimate goal of dating is supposedly marriage. Like, obviously, it doesn't work out with everyone, but eventually you date so you marry someone. I think that's a very valid concern, and that's definitely one I've heard a lot of people voice and even at times maybe have crossed my own mind when out dating. But I think that there are just a few things I've chosen personally to reframe with that, which is that, first of all, even though there's this like really intimate bond between a black woman and a black male, because we're able to relate on what I've heard called post-traumatic 
slave syndrome. Um, it's still, there's still always a layer between you and the other person. Mm -hmm. And I think when you keep that in mind, um, that's there no matter who you date. And that's mm -hmm. something that you're going to have to be comfortable with. And each couple finds their workarounds for it. each couple finds a certain point when they're like, except like, I know you as well as I can know you, but there's always this part I'm not. And I think once you accept that, that doesn't become something that weighs on you. I mean, and I think too, when you have an interracial family, parents accept that there's certain things I can't teach my kid, but certain things you can. And parenting's a, a tag team. You guys work out what you guys are bringing to the table as parents. And I think that interracial parents make the conscious, most of them, obviously they're the ones, like you said, I think just sleep in their little la la land, but. I think the parents who are genuinely working to give their, every parent wants the best for their child, regardless of race. And if you understand your child is a member of two races and how America treats, um, mixed children that are, are part black, then I think that you guys accept like there are certain things dad's going to have to field and certain things mom's going to have to field. And then certain and understanding that you guys can formulate your parenting style in a way where you're supporting each other. So I think families, every family makes sacrifices and every family makes decisions. And I think that ultimately, if you are choosing to date, I think it's a little different dating outside your race when the person's not white. I think dating a white person for any ethnicity is kind of, there, there's, it's a bigger barrier between you and that person. I think like there's a little more understanding with a black person and a Latino person or a black yeah, person and an Asian person. There's a little more understanding between us. I wouldn't because say Asian, but. I mean, it can be different with Asian people as well because they've been, they've also been affected by systematic racism in that they're forced into being the secondary white. And that's yep. not necessarily a choice. We see a lot of Asians expressing themselves creatively and artistically mm -hmm. and being very vocal about the fact that, um, white society has made this, this mass for them that they're these really stiff mathematic people and that's not an accurate portrayal. So I think Asian people too, I, I include in like the more soulful category because that is a myth that they're these cold type of more white like people. That's a complete myth. That's mm -hmm. something that was made to further separate and divide minorities. So, I mean, I think just you're always going to have an issue when you're dating a white person, straight up. But I don't think that means you shouldn't or you can't or that that person's just never going to have the capacity to be a good partner for you because of their lack of understanding. You don't always need to understand something to support something. Like, I'm seeing a lot of white people post very genuine posts on Instagram about how I will never understand, but I will fight and explaining why they're fighting, what they're fighting for, and asking for more help to educate themselves. I Something that's been really hitting me as I'm going into working with young children and focusing on children who have survived trauma is that no child, children are colorblind until we put our implicit bias on them and we teach them to behave in a certain yeah, way. Yeah, I mean, everyone fucking knows that. So something not that... born a racist. <laughs> right. So that is a common thought, fair <laughs> enough. But something that I go to next is like, just, we're always thinking about how does it make the black child feel to learn they're the descendant of a slave? How does it make this white child who's still currently innocent, who has not... I mean, well, that's been affected yet to find out that they're from a legacy of abusers. That's the I wrong. That's like, the wrong. That's the wrong thing like, to teach the black child. I feel like crap if I found out I'm from a legacy of abusers. So I think we teach the way we teach slavery and the way we teach our history in America does not only make our black children feel lesser than it makes our white children feel lesser than, and that white guilt is what trips them up. Well, We're wrong? basically what's... teaching them you're a white devil. You're a little white devil. You're a little horrible thing because of what your ancestors did. Just like we're telling black kids, like you're worthless because of your ancestors and it's not fair to either child of either race. Well, I don't think white kids are being taught in the school system that they're white devils. I not think, explicitly, but I mean, when I sit I in the think, classrooms I, and see the way we're teaching, we're now that we're teaching it at all, people are happy. Like, oh, yay, we're teaching these children about race. They're like, yay, that's it. We've done it. That's not good enough. Well, we need you, to pay I mean, attention to how The school we're system, you guys need to teach these kids the truth. If black children were taught what they really are, there's no way in hell a black kid should be insecure about being black or ashamed of being black. If black people were taught what the fuck their hit their real history about uh, their real history about their people, they would know that we are 
descendants of kings and queens. We we were the first people on earth. We're the only of. Uh, I don't want to say race because there's I mean there's only one race, the human race. But there, we're the only. I'll just say race for, to, for this example. We're the only race that you can be black as a tire or light as a fucking a cloud, but you'll still be. You, I mean, you're still black. Right. We make different type. We're the only race that makes different types of pigmentation. Um, if black people were taught the truth, they would know that Christopher Columbus was not the first person to sail around the world. It was a black man. Oh, dude. Okay, you're one of the first people. I've, I was really into that a few years ago and just reading everything I could on it. So it's yeah, really I mean, cool that you're Christopher. Up on yeah, that. But the history books tell you. That Christopher Columbus was the first person to sail around the world. Why? Because why would they give that credit to a black man who was the actual first one to sail around the world, an African? And then the Portuguese, uh, I mean, the, uh, the Spaniards were obsessed with, uh, with black people. And then that's why Christopher Columbus sailed around the world because he wanted to find out about, uh, I think it's, I think his name is Ma, uh, King Mamusa or some shit no, like that. No, Mansa Musa. Mansa yeah. Musa, yeah. And um, so, yeah, people just need to learn their real history, and the I, and the school system does not teach true history. I and I think that's up agree. to the parents to fucking teach your kids. Send them to school, but once they get home, learn, look at what the fuck you're teach your homework. Like, yo, this is not true. Tell your fucking son the truth. This ain't true. The fucking Christopher Columbus didn't sail around the world first. No, it was, and then take this little nigga and yo, yo, this black dude sailed around the world, world, and tell him, learn, put that in his mind, send his ass to school, and make him debate his fucking teacher. And I guarantee his teacher will be like, oh, how the fuck did you know about that? Oh, man. That's not what we're supposed to teach you. We're supposed to teach you this shit so you guys can feel inferior to to white people. Right. Um, I mean, just to quickly touch on where I was going with my example might have been extreme, but I guess my point was I do buy the white ally stepping up. I do buy it because I think that not everyone's going to hear what their ancestors did and be okay with it. There are going to be people that are outraged and want to make change genuinely. And Mm -hmm. I do, I do buy that. And I've had the opportunity to make friends with lifelong friends with plenty of white people who are genuinely good people striving for change. So yeah. I buy it was, I guess, my point with the two children. Like, we're kind of like treating for me the black children like, oh, poor little baby. Oh, we'll just slap a bandaid on it and ignoring the, the white kids and the psychological impact on them of being ignored because stats are showing they don't agree with their parents in terms of racial issues. Mm. They're aligned with liberal thinking. And so kind of when they're oppressed and when they're forced into this doctrine, like indoctrination of like white supremacy, then we see them doing stuff like snapping mentally and shooting up schools. So I think that all of our children, I guess my, that's my point, white and black Mm. in particular are affected by the way that they're being introduced to race in America for the negative on both sides. Yeah. It's crippling the black kids and it's, it's, kind of messing up the white kids psychologically Mm. to give a very overgeneralization of my thoughts. Um, And in terms of just kind of like what we should teach our children, ideally, yes. But I do think that there's an onus on young teachers like myself to imbue that into our classrooms. If we know that the system's messed up and we are aware of what we could be teaching, and that a lot of these children come from homes where the, either the parent doesn't know or is is unable to because they're working three and four jobs or whatever else. I think like there's literally nothing stopping us. You do have to teach the the curriculum, but you have all this time in your day with that stu- those students to keep it real. I had a really cool teacher who was black, um, like I think she was Cuban or Puerto Rican was her background. And she would literally knock out in the first few minutes of the class what we had to know for the like standardized test and then formulate her lesson that day around the 
appropriate like counters to that. Like what were black people really doing at this time? What were yeah. white people really doing at this time? And she'd yeah. give us tips and tricks to remember what to say on the test. Cause we had to take it and perspectives on test taking. Cause it was a reality, but she dedicated more of her class time to telling us the truth. And so that's something that I think all teachers can what do. What was this teacher's name? Um, Belkia Hoy. What school was this? This is at Berkeley High, which she hated because of the way they treated her for being woke and mm. left very this shortly. This was a black teacher? Yeah, she was black. Um, and it was really cool because as we're talking about different subsects of the black experience, she's Afro Latina. So, but she looks, she's darker skinned with dreads. So, you know, yeah. like if she were walking down the street, she'd be stereotyped as just black, but she has this very immense like Latino culture behind her as mm-hmm. well. And that was one of the many things she taught us about is like black isn't one thing. Mm hmm. So I just think that, like, I mean, ideally, I agree. Parents should be teaching kids that. But something that kind of caused the, like, discrepancy with me and other students was that I had parents who strove to teach me about black history. Then I'm in the classroom with other black kids acting honestly ignorant, not by any fault of their own, but just because that's the environment they were raised in and they didn't go home to much stability. So I'm sitting there getting mad at my own people because I'm thinking it's normal that your parents are talking to you. Yeah. And I'm realizing now it's not a reality. These kids aren't going home and getting that from their parents. I think younger parents, I think parents in liberal areas like the Bay, like I watch my homegirls who are raising kids now, they're on it. But I mean, they're from our generation. So like their opinions on educating at home are different. So I think like with, and all teachers are aware of this. Don't let them tell you they're not every single teacher, whether they just graduated college or in their novice knows that you have opportunity in your classroom to tell the truth and Mm -hmm. to properly educate your students It's your choice, whether or not you make the effort to do so. Well, I mean, I'm going to just put, I'm going to say two statements and then we're going to get off this subject. First statement is black people need to stop waiting uh, and expecting and thinking that they need white people to change shit. I mean, it's all good that white people are standing up, marching with us and shit like that. I mean, it's expected. But black people seem to think that in order to get something done, we need white society to get it done black people seem to think oh i need to i need to open a uh, like a business or something i need to go to this white bank or go to the white loan officer or whatever or to a white media to get uh, to like start a business you don't need that do it yourself or do it within your own fucking culture so that's my first uh that's my first statement second statement is The education, uh, don't forget my second statement. I forgot what I was about to say. <laughs> but anyway, let's get okay. off this subject. So yeah. you, uh, you grew up in Berkeley? I did grow up in Berkeley. And you went to Berkeley High? I did, I did. What year did you finish? 2009. So what was high school like for you? Um, at the time that I was going to Berkeley High, the culture was shifting to a more wealthy. Yep. I don't know if it always was that way or it goes through ins and outs with that because while Berkeley is a very kind of humble hippie culture, there's also an element of Berkeley that is extremely wealthy, like 1% wealthy. And oh, yeah, you ever been to the <laughs> Berkeley Hills before? And Berkeley High uh, is is largely funded and controlled by the financial interests of these wealthier parents. So yeah, you can tell you can tell Berkeley has money. All you gotta do is look at their football field. That shit, that shit looks like a goddamn college. They're uh, getting a new building field. like every year too, which is crazy. And nice buildings, not just this quick slap together stuff. So. Yeah. When I went there, all that new building was beginning. They were switching principals. There was stuff that students we didn't get was going on behind the scenes. Like, uh, there was a lot of rumor that didn't make sense to us because we're minors just going to school, but we would hear about like, oh, this person's being back for principal by the wealthy North Berkeley people. This person's not, they want this person out. Like, mm-hmm. so there's a lot of politics going on that students don't understand. And then, the bulk of the black students and Latino students, there are some obviously Asian and Middle Eastern 
but those are the two largest uh, minority demographics at Berkeley High. They're bused in from Richmond and Oakland. So you don't have to live They're in Berkeley not to go to that school? You do not, but you have to maintain a ridiculous, an unattainable GPA. So what typically happens to these bus in students is they either use a grandparent that used to... A lot of these are families that were in Berkeley, yeah. but got pushed out due to gentrification, mm-hmm. which is just a side note. I hear a lot of my Oakland friends complaining. Berkeley's fully gentrified. They've won. There's no more ethnic area. There's no more... They've got Berkeley. So, I mean, <laughs> when I hear people in Oakland complain, I'm like, y'all still... Y'all got people. Yo, y'all got grassroots. You guys can do something. Your town's not taken over yet. Mm-hmm. Um, I Like, the street my family lives on is like, all white now is just completely changed. Mm-hmm. There's like one low income house on the street with African American people who unfortunately don't behave the best. So give a bad stereotype, a stereotypical representation. And that's like it is just like white. And the area at the time that my grandmother moved in, at least from what I'm told by elders in my family was like, it wasn't good. It was like considered part of West Berkeley, like waterfront. Now it's considered central, right by Berkeley High, million dollar homes. Mm -hmm. And she's like the only black person there. Mm -hmm. So let alone ethnic person there. So Berkeley, when I was going there, all of that was hidden its peak. The gentrification, the interests of wealthy people and students were aware enough to protest actively. So there were a lot of protests and opportunities to get involved when I was going there. So my experience there was rough academically because the coursework was not set up for a black student to succeed. And I did not feel supported, but it was very rich in terms of my social life because it was the last year that we had a running African-American studies department Mm-hmm. And we were one of only three high schools in America that had one of those, period. So I did every African-American studies class they offered, and I was chair of the arts for BSU, and that dramatically changed my life for the better, I feel. And so that's the positive I take from my Berkeley High experience. But now my sister, a decade younger than me, has just graduated a year ago, and her experience there was that she was one of the only black faces on campus because they did this big uh, house sweep to check for all the bus-in kids that were faking their address, got rid of them. What is that? that leaves the school predominantly white. Barely anyone there is ethnic. This is pretty much an all-white school that's public, but it's operating as private because of private interests, and the money filtered into it. So my sister's experience there was god awful. There was no BSU. There was no black camaraderie. She barely met any other black kids or knew any other black kids. She felt ostracized from the white kids. So it was an awful experience. And basically, the years I spent there were trying to combat that happening for my sister. But it did. And as sad as it did happen and we lost that battle, it, it, I think it really, and I'm not the only person that I'm still in touch with that was on BSU that I think it dramatically changed their life and black studies dramatically changed their life. Mm. So I think we got a lot out of it, but we were, I would argue the last generation because they disbanded the black studies and BSU after that. Mm. So after high school, what did you, uh, where did you go? I went to St. Mary's College in Moraga. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I pers- okay, so I hear that it's been great for a lot of minority students. I have a good friend who is a doctor Any now. Any college that begins with saints, you know it's going to be <laughs> fucked up toward minorities. I hear good things from others. Like the basketball, the athletes. I hated every second there. And uh, to go a little personal, it, My experience there led to me having mental health issues and Mm. having to seek clinical help because it was that bad and the mental, it wasn't physical abuse, but the mental abuse I endured there was that awful. And, um, I mean, it was just literally, it made me never want to go to school again. What were you studying though? Philosophy. I was hoping to be a lawyer Mm. and civil rights lawyer. So this is... (laughs) This has changed the whole way. Like I said, my whole way of wanting to combat the injustices I see has completely changed because, I mean, I was convinced I was going to law school and I was going to tear down the white So supremacy. you stopped your dream because of the, the shit that was going on in school? I didn't stop it because of school. The experiences I had in school... Um, Tell me some experiences you had in school. Well, like the first week of classes... We had to, there was no BSU, so we started it. 
Um, and so I was chair and I, me and a bunch of kids put up posters. So we decided to partner with GSA because St. Mary's is, I don't know if they still are, but they were going through this whole thing where they were publicizing proudly. We're a liberal Catholic school. We have a gay priest and we have a B, we have a GSA and it's so awesome. Mm-hmm. And that was the club that was getting the most love and the most money from the, uh, administration. So mm-hmm. we partnered with them for our first meeting and we put up posters everywhere. I mean, I woke up the next morning from my 8 a.m. and nigger was written all over them in fag. Mm-hmm. And that, I guess maybe to another person, they'd be like, whatever, and shake it off. But for me, especially coming from Berkeley, 18, wide-eyed, hopeful, was just, like, I can't even put up a, po- like, if you don't agree, you don't agree, fine. But I mean, also I'm an artist and I worked really hard on the posters. Yeah. So it's like, I mean, for me, it was just sign number one. And well, then, first of all, were you, ex- it goes back to my earlier point. Were you expecting anything different from I white, was from expecting white silent hatred, but I honestly thought, cause my family is Catholic, uh, there, but I mean, I think the experience of being a black or a Creole Catholic is very different than being a white Catholic. I must be honest, but I've never experienced. I've heard on the news of Catholics making an ass of themselves or saying they hate gays or, or something offensive like that. But mm-hmm. I've never experienced that growing up in a black Cre- Creole Catholic community. It's been welcoming and loving. So you're Catholic? Um, I personally have converted to Buddhism, but my family is. And I still observe traditions out of the love for my family and the camaraderie. Mm. Um So, I mean, I definitely thought a Catholic campus in the Bay Area wouldn't I didn't think they would act like that. I thought there'd be a few people within the crowd who are silent closet racists, but I honestly thought it's the Bay, it's St. Mary's. On top of which, you're blind. That's my what you're my my parents <laughs> went there and they fell in love there. So I thought it was I had this perception of it as it would be a safe school yeah. for an African American woman. Mm-hmm. That was not the case because that's the littlest of the instances I experienced there. And that was just day one. Uh, so I chose this, that small one because one, it's a shorter story. And two, I think it illustrates if that happened on day one yeah. and it only escalated from there and I was there four years. I mean, you know, you can kind of put your imagination to work that it's just kept getting worse and worse. Did you ever get attacked by any... Uh- I did not get physically harmed, but things like burning a cross on the lawn... Just like they burned a cross on the line. They did. Mars. They did. And it was all over the news. And then the school claims they did not cover it up. But uh there were several things the school I I believe I don't have proof, but it's an extremely wealthy school. Who was the most influential black student at that black man at that school? Um the person that was a, that was a student. The person that I feel was the most influential did not been there they're proudly black but they did not spend their time pushing their influence in the realm of being black they, so he was a coon that's what you're saying they str- no they he struggled a lot he did a lot of he did a lot of protesting he started a uh, healing he was a, a psychology student he started a healing safe space night yeah. so i feel like he did a lot of work and he really showed them and he dressed nice every day he wore like a suit to class every day so i feel like this man I don't know. I used to feel I was always confused because he's openly black and proud. He does never shies away from it. But I was confused as to why he did make the school, in my opinion, a better place by doing he staged one of the things he did was he staged a protest on the lawn where he literally him and several people camped out on the front lawn. When you enter the school, their big brand lawn, they make a big deal out of with a statue. Mm. He camped out there for months until the grass was dying. So that's like, and that was for, he did that one for the 99% protests that were going on because he felt like, uh, the finance and the financial aid there is messed up. They really don't give you anything at all. Um, so I mean, that's one of the many well, things that, not, that wasn't really a black, uh, Exactly my that's my point. I think he did a lot for the school and he got a lot accomplished, but none of them were directly a black issue. Who was the statue of? The statue, I'm gonna say it's a brother John de la Salle. Do you know the history of John de la Salle? He supposedly saved orphans. So you never heard about him molesting orphans? I have no I haven't heard that, but I always I haven't heard that either. I'm, I'm always a little <laughs> scary that that's going to happen like I'm going to hear about somebody molesting somebody in in my local Catholic sphere which would be like, "Okay, see, I was vouching oh, yeah. for you guys. Now I look like I'm associated I with mean, this." I mean, all the fucking there's 
so many colleges with names, name, with buildings named after racist people. People yeah. used to own slaves, and even black colleges. Spelman is 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 named after a white uh, racist okay. person, and that's a black college. Yeah. So. Somebody yeah. just was telling me that I actually don't know the facts on that. But. Yeah, it's um. So uh, I believe uh, I mean he Spelman was he's is named after a white white person who was racist. Um, Rockefeller, you know Rockefeller, right? Yeah. He Rockefeller. I mean, there's some connection with uh, uh, Rockefeller also, mm-hmm. and Rockefeller. We already know the history of Rockefeller. It's not Rockefeller Records. It's Rockefeller the fucking. Uh, financial racism monopoly I, didn't he yeah. i don't remember no he i don't think he invented monopoly but he was credited for the first time we see one in the u.s and that's crazy if you think about how much business the u.s does we're a country of business and how many other greedy white people there are how are you so greedy of all the greedy white guys that you make the first and only monopoly known on you known on u.s soil i'm yeah. sure there's secret ones but i think that's pretty radic like radical that he accomplished that yeah well anyway um <laughs> So you did you uh, start going seeking therapy? Um, I mean, I I didn't really. My college experience was more so that by the time my parents were not intentionally, and this is something I'm learning as I'm working through a psych degree, is that when a child has a problem, particularly a minority child, the parents might fall into denial as a natural defense mechanism for their inability to assist this child or Mm -hmm. for the fears they think um, having a mental issue would add to this child already being black or, or Mexican or whatever this child may be. So my parents, um, are actually really great parents, but at this point in my life caused tension between us, I would say for the first time, because I have a really good relationship with them. And it was because they are, it was because at that point in time, they were in denial. And I I mean, it wasn't intentional of me needing assistance. I really just didn't know what was wrong. I just knew something was up and I couldn't be at the school anymore. And I came to- When did you start realizing that you needed therapy? I feel like sophomore year, and then I didn't get any form of assistance until senior year after I had kind of made the decision to defer and potentially drop out. What I wanted to do was drop out, but the compromise was you'll defer and you'll go back because I had to do a fifth year. So you'll go back. But then my parents just, you'll go back, you'll be there, you're fine. And kind of had this mentality, like your ancestors made it through the middle passage, so suck it up. You live in California, you got a good life. Okay, the kids are bullying you, suck it up. What was changing about you to make you notice, like, yo, I need therapy? Well, I just noticed that um, my kind of, like, what they call, like, coping mechanisms in psychology or resilience factors. Mm -hmm. I was losing my resilience factors, the things that would keep me give me the bounce back. Like maybe I would cry for an hour, get it all out, eat some chocolate ice cream or something and get back on it. So I was like, I don't have, I'm not recovering anymore. I'm, I don't have any more resilience factors. I'm not able to bounce my mood back up. I'm not able to cheer myself back up, get my head in the game, work on this essay. I'm not able to do that. And that's something that if you know you're a healthy person, you should be able to do for yourself. Yeah. Okay. You're going to have a hard day. Yeah. Okay. You're going to be sad, but you should be able to recover. So the inability to recover is kind of a sign you're going to need professional help to get you back on the wheel of, of self-care and taking care of yourself and, and recovering. And these are things I don't really have vocabulary for, and I didn't necessarily immediately get help because my insurance didn't cover it and my parents were still struggling with it. But the process of getting help for me began senior year at St. Mary's. And then I decided I'm not going back. I'll figure out what I'm doing about my education, but I will not be going to a small private ever again. And I will not be going to a Catholic ever again. So then I took after that, maybe like five, seven years to genuinely work on my mental health, volunteer, do activism and work on my career as an artist and use those things to better discover myself and what I actually want to do because studying law was making me unhappy. And I, wasn't the lawyers I was meeting and talking to were kind of telling me run the other way and that, you know, I'm going to go into all this debt to make no money to probably not help my clients. I'm probably going to sit in the courtroom and see these, these officers get acquitted. So Mm -hmm. learning things like that made me think I want to do the thing where I feel I can be most effective and where I feel I can see physical results. So for me, I've 
over the years switch my view and where I think I can help people to mental health within the black community. Do you think uh, you switched your view because of what you believe in or someone coerced you by giving you false information that you, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't be able to help your community? You know, maybe a part of it was false information, but I genuinely think I switched my view because I saw the profound effect that taking care of my mental health had on my life and my ability to let things go, to manifest, to be a successful human being. And for me, I feel that the more I'm learning about mental health in the black community, the more I feel like we need it. And I have the capacity to, to offer it as mm. I mean, once I'm certified, of course, <laughs> but this is something I, I have seen through my clinical hours in classrooms with kids and working with kids. Um, like specifically my last placement was working with children in Richmond, California who are survivors of trauma, primary, all minority children. And I literally saw, and I was just the, like the, basically like the, uh, the clinician like grades me on how well I'm practicing techniques with these kids. Mm -hmm. And so I was really, I felt that I made progress, but then I got like actual confirmation I did from these three clinicians who were value, watch me over the span of a year. And I mean, like to know that I have literally improved this child's capacity to succeed in life by working on their mental, getting them early and helping them develop res resilience factors. So maybe they're going to go into the Richmond school system, but I've worked with them on how to deal with, Oh, you're getting blocked by this teacher. These are resources you can go here, et yeah. cetera. So I genuinely feel like law is just, I'm not, it's not for me at this point. Maybe a portion of it was getting scared by people's words, but I, I know genuinely the profound effect that mental health as that in my life and that I have a knack for it. I'm excelling in my coursework. You're still in school right now, right? Yeah, I'm trying to. So because I had dropped out of St. Mary's originally, I spent the last four years uh, finishing the credits I need to apply to a master's. So right now I'm working on the master's. It's going to be a three-year process for me. I just started it. <laughs> what school are you at now? Uh, San Francisco State. I'm hoping to get to International School of International Studies in San Francisco is where I ultimately, because they're one of, I can build the art therapy major at SF State, but they have it at School of International Studies. So, anyway, so you're, you're in school now seeking a master's yes. in, in, in art? Art therapy, yeah. Okay. So it's psych me. You have to do what you do is you build your own art portfolio of your own work, and you have your own work critiqued, and you do amount of studio hours, and then that's half your your master's program, mm. and then the other half your program is you're doing the psych work. Um, you're doing child and family psych work, and so they, you, they combine for an art therapist degree. Do you think uh, you wasted time uh, going to St. Mary's studying? Um, to be a, uh, a lawyer? I do, I do, but I... Because it sounds like your passion is art. I definitely think I wasted my time. That was what I had come to my parents with when I first realized something was wrong. I was like, hey, if I go to... I looked it all up, I talked to counselors, it would have been fairly easy for me to do a year or two at Berkeley City College, build an art portfolio, and get an art scholarship, or at least hope I got one, and go to an art school mm -hmm. where I would have been better positioned, I think, uh, to get into this art therapy master's I'm, I'm working so hard to get into now, because... What happened is essentially St. Mary's is on a special track called the diocese run by the Catholic Church in Rome. Mm -hmm. I'm all the way out here. So what yeah. happens is their credits aren't accepted at most universities. So it's like either you finish there or you try to transfer somewhere and none of your credits are valid for anything. So I've had to spend the last four years petitioning for credits that I know should be valid and retaken credits just to get to this master's when had I kind of followed my instinct I would already be there or done. But the flip side is I think that I know myself more intimately than the average person does and still having that philosopher side of me and that passion for philosophy. I personally believe that's one of the main goals of your life as a human is to truly know oneself. And I think that I, I because I've gone through all these ups and downs and I've tried all these different avenues, I've, I have a really intimate knowledge of self 
and more so than the average person. And I think that's a blessing. And that that's what I look at as what came from all this and what I look at as, as moving me forward. Now I've like through, through what do they call it? Fire and brimstone. I've, I've made this very solid foundation to the woman I am. So there's definitely stuff I'm unhappy about, about the years I spent at St. Mary's and the subsequent years I, I, I spent trying to figure it out. But overall, I've come to this place that's really, I mean, I don't know, kind of fresh and new, mm. but with like wisdom. So it's working out, but there's always going to be a certain level of regret, you know? What, uh, after you finish school and all that, what's, what job do you want to have? What's your ideal job? I plan, I'm a preschool teacher. So I plan on teaching preschool while I, uh, figure out if I can, finance my own private practice which would really just be renting a room in a studio and developing a client list or see if i can contract to minority like school districts like richmond and oakland so you want to do therapy yeah with with children yeah like the type of the when you contract to the district and you get to go to several schools and pull out the in need kids and work with them for an hour or so a day Mm -hmm. i'd be down to do that it does not pay that much is the first thing people always say but it's cool because i have a lot of other avenues i'm interested in and things i do such as my artwork so i wouldn't mind doing something i love and enjoy doing that gives me schedule freedom and then i can you know increase my finances in other ways but i definitely We'll start, I already know, with a preschool classroom for some stability after graduation because it's just part of life has to be practical. Do you think you need uh, a college degree to accomplish your goals? I don't think I need it, quite frankly. Like, honestly, all my classes are already repetition, and I've already done more clinical hours than the average student, which is ultimately what you have to do to get the certification i i really feel like i could take that test right now but because of the way things work i have to have it i feel like i could literally go i mean i've been doing free therapy work because that's what you do as a student for four years with amazing Mm -hmm. results with clients so i think i could do it right now but and i don't think i need the degree to do it either like there's plenty of healers you know we see a lot of healers, especially in like the Oakland area. They don't have a degree necessarily, but yeah. they know they know what they're doing. You don't need to have the degree to know what you're doing. So no, I don't feel that I need it, but to do it legally and obviously be able to work with school districts, I do have to have that paper. Okay. Um what I was about to ask you. Your art, your little uh, happy hour art thing. Oh, yes, yeah. <laughs> when, I, when was this created and why did you create it? So I actually... And, and explain what it is, actually. Okay, so I... Um, let's see, what is it? So this is not an idea I actually originated. I actually don't know who originated it, but where I saw it being done initially was tech companies. My friends that were able to stomach St. Mary's and graduate all have really pretty plush tech jobs. Mm -hmm. And so they started quarantining the second they heard about COVID because these tech jobs have the money to set you up at home. They were sent desk, computers, stay home. So something I saw that these company and something I know that these companies do, because that's kind of what I did uh, part time to get through school is I would temp as a a front desk at tech companies. They do happy hours, like the thing to keep the the hipster employees happy. So what I saw them doing was a company happy hour. And I thought that's a good idea. But like, who really wants to sit on zoom with their boss on a Friday night? And so I kind of was like, what would happy hour look, what would the Zoom happy hour look like if it were genuinely done with the community in mind and unwinding and connecting and just kind of letting off steam about this COVID situation? What would that look like? So I thought I'll do one just for the heck of it, because um, being that San Francisco was one of the first cities to shut down. And I'm attending SF State. I've been on quarantine probably almost a month longer than the average person has. So I immediately just tried to envision a happy hour that actually serviced people. And so I just thought I draw, I have this iPad, I'll do a little funny. For me, it's funny. I do cartooning. I like funny art, though I respect all art. Um, but I kind of like, I like to laugh, especially if it's kind of a dirty joke or a cynical joke. That's what gets me. So I thought, let me do these just like really funny childish flyers and 
leave the space open for people to just drink and unwind or speak if they so choose. And it kind of, people were really enjoying it. So I went from just kind of addressing just my friends to addressing my larger group of associates on Instagram. And then I started seeing people doing coloring pages for adults. And I've always wanted to do that. So I started doing coloring pages as my contribution. I had a friend that um, produces, plays some beats, a friend that raps just kind of freestyle, and then a friend that does tarot, do tarot. So the idea was just to, like, yes, have fun, but also have fun in a way that's like addressing our mental health. Like it's mad stressful. We're not working. <laughs> We're stuck at home. We want to see each other. We want to hang out. And I mean, I don't know your listeners, like how far they'll span, but like at least here in, in Oakland, like we hit our bars up on the weekend. Like we have a long week. It's Friday and we know who we're going to see there and we know who's going to be bartending. It's mm-hmm. kind of like cheers. Oh, the Oakland way. Like, we, we, that's our thing. Yeah. So I think, you know, some people might look at that and be like, Oh, alcoholics. But for us, it's like, it's really like, it's a community thing. Like we, like, I know I'll roll up to like make Westing and I'll see everybody I know and I'll sit outside and it'll be like great and I'll vibe and it'll wash the stress of my week away. So that's just kind of the intent with it. I actually haven't been doing them formally right now or advertising them. I still have the space open for people who want to come. Only reason for that is they started getting so crowded when you have like 30 people. Oh, people on- were actually coming <laughs> physically to a, a space? The Zoom, no. Oh, the this Zoom is Zoom. The Zoom was getting like, when you have so many people on the Zoom, you can't all talk. And so uh, the space wasn't, the digital space wasn't as effective. How many people can be on a, a Zoom at one time? I haven't hit, I haven't hit a limit. But um, I just purchased a premium account so it doesn't exit me out in an hour since I use it for school and family. Yeah. And then the happy hour, I thought, let's do the premium. So I don't know that I have a limit with the premium account. Mm-hmm. So I'm still doing them, but I'm not doing the flyer every week or making them as big of a deal because uh, it got overloaded and more focused on yelling over each other and drinking, which isn't a bad thing. Because so that's, what are all, like people up there arguing and shit? Just like, hey, no, listen to me now. Hey, take a shot. And it's just like, <laughs> it is supposed to be fun. We are supposed to be drinking, but we yeah. can't hear each other. Yeah. And we're, and we're completely forgetting, you know, there's a little, we do a little bit of check in, you know, we can't, if you don't want it to get too serious, respect, but we do need to do a little check in. We do need to allow people to, to is be it able mostly to see. women. It's been really up and down. Um, I kind of like being in the bay all my life and having, lived in several cities and gone to several schools and worked with several organizations. I realized from doing these that different people from my different groups of of friends, family, et cetera, were showing up and I would get these fun, but random combinations of people and they wouldn't know each other, but I would know all of them. So it would be, sometimes it would be like almost all guys, all girls, even mix sometimes more of my African American or my black friends. And then sometimes totally racially diverse crowds. So that was something I really enjoyed about the happy hours was you never knew who was stopping by. And it was always somehow the right mix for that Friday. What time does the happy hour start? It's six o'clock to eight o'clock. And I have all the, it's the same meeting ID every time, no password. So like basically now that I'm not hyping it up as much to keep it calmer, people can really just save the meeting ID, which is on my page and just come in and I just leave it open on Fridays. And what I do now is I sketch uh, and I just see who shows up and I provide a coloring page if people want a coloring page. What I was hoping, but I didn't quite have time because I'm horrible at math and I have to take this like stats for like working with demographics or something. I don't know, but it's like stats for like taking all my patient files and like putting them into, and I mean like Mm -hmm. math is not my strong suit. It's the one area I feel like I genuinely am like. I know a mathematician I can introduce (laughs) you. That would be great. <laughs> so that has, these last three weeks, that really got in the way of me revamping the happy hour. But what I want to do with it, since quarantine will be continuing, they're saying, up until at least fall, I want to... <laughs> this shit is opening up on Friday. They're saying for like 
institutions and things like that. Uh, like schools aren't still aren't open. They're going to open for little kids only because parents can't keep them anymore. Yeah. But like if you're like college level, high school level, et cetera. Parents are killing their kids. That's why they're getting tired of the shit. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> I'm just like my brother said the other day, cause he doesn't like working with kids. That's my jam. He hates it, but they love him. I think they just like seeing like a brother that's like got his, I don't yeah. know, representation. It feels I don't like good. kids either. Kids like grown ups who don't like kids uh. because they they want to they like oh it's like a I don't know it's like a dog when you don't <laughs> pet your dog he wants he fucks with you more when you yeah. don't show your dog affection he wants to fuck with you more it's just like kids like I hate I don't I don't hate kids but I don't like kids and a lot of kids want to be around me for that reason and they're drawn they're drawn to it I can see that yeah. I mean kids I'm not gonna lie to you kids are challenging as hell and. A lot of parents are doing the best they can, but because obviously you're coming from the standpoint as a parent and not a professional, you doing certain things that aren't necessarily good for them psychologically or emotionally. It's not on purpose. You're just being yourself, raising your kid, but like it's happening. So a lot of what happens at school that you don't get to see as a parent is like we're trying to make sure your kid doesn't grow up to be an asshole because they've learned certain things unintentionally at home that they shouldn't learn. Yeah. Um, Do you have kids? I don't have kids. I, (laughs) and everyone laughs at me for this or thinks I'm crazy. I don't want to have any. I really would like to adopt. I really feel strongly about adopting. Why? And I really feel strongly about not having any. You don't want to go through the pregnancy phase? I really don't find it appealing. I mean, I wouldn't either if I was a woman. Like, I hear from, like, my homegirls and the women in my family, uh, just like, it's beautiful, you're going to love it, da 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 And maybe it's because I study, I have to study children from in- from inception to five years old, because that's the demographic I work with. Mm-hmm. Like, I, I like, and especially, I'm really into aliens and alien culture, that's my nerdy side. The process of a baby being formed is the same process as a xenomorph popping out of your chest so that's just one example of how i feel it's a xenomorph it's the aliens from the movie alien they're called xenomorphs (laughs) (laughs) all right don't you don't you want something that's i mean i understand adapting but don't you want something that your body is going to create like come out looking like you and all that shit i'd like to leave behind my intellectual property the way that like I mean, even though I try to read non-white, especially non-white male authors, no offense, there's plenty of great ones. I can't lie that Plato has really, that was my first time encountering a philosophic work Mm -hmm. and it's left a lasting impression on me. And I still go back to it to this day, Plato's Republic. And something that I really took from it is leaving behind intellectual property. However you feel about this old dead gay white guy, he literally wrote something that we're still reading centuries later. And I think that's the type of impact I'd like to make in my lifetime. And for me, that comes at the community level. When I think of how the Black Panthers started the free lunch initiative, that's like, I feel like I can do that in my lifetime. I can start something that is lasting beyond me. And that's a child to me. That's what you ultimately, at least from a psychological standpoint, you have a child to leave behind, Mm -hmm. um, yourself essentially there's so many ways you can leave yourself behind and for me personally i'm very cynical i this isn't a world i'd want to bring a child into nor a world i would want to die and leave my child in alone i mean well so you say not bringing a child into the world but i mean when you're adopting a child this fucking world is still going to be the same and i feel differently about that because exactly i feel like they didn't choose to be here they didn't choose to be um abandoned given up or just you know the parent couldn't or whatever the reason is and i did i don't feel like they deserve to navigate this what i feel is a shitty world alone so i feel more comfortable assisting a child who's already here and 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 helpless and needs somebody than bringing a child here and putting them into a state of of pain i mean Mm. i'm gonna have a black child that's the reality and no matter how much change we make right now I strongly doubt we'll see the type of change I want my child to experience in my lifetime, let alone theirs. On top of which, like I said, I'm cynical and most major scientists believe the earth only has 30 more years unless we correct this pollution thing. So it's like, why would I bring my child in here Mm -hmm. to this earth to be abused, potentially shot by a cop to potentially, even if we fix all that racial stuff, uh, how are we fixing the ozone? How are we fixing the ocean? Like, I mean, it's just not a world. I, 
I want to bring a child into personally. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't necessarily know that I want myself to be carried on to the extent of bringing a person, creating a life. Like, I don't know that I value, I'm contributing. I don't know yet. My story is not done for me to think I'm a great enough person to make another one of me. I'm still fleshing out my story and where I'm going. Mm-hmm. So and I definitely think, you know, if the kids are already here, they deserve somebody on the, in their corner. And that's why I feel comfortable with the concept of adoption. Like they need somebody. How many kids do you want to adopt? Three. Mm-hmm. So you want three kids and you want to be, you don't want to be married. I, I don't mind uh, marriage, but I want to marry for love. If not, there's so many other Duh, things. That's, what, that's the whole point. <laughs> there's so many other things we could do to to solidify our finances and our children's futures financially. Um, a straight people can enter domestic partnerships. Well, if I don't is, love you, that's it all we're really Isn't it very rare that single people, single women, are able to adopt? Like, don't they look down on that? Like, it they want ha- you to be historically married. Historically, it has. Unless you're like rich, rich celebrity. <clears throat> historically, it has been, but um, there are ways you get around that i.e. like the field i'm in would qualify me because they would as long as i have a clean record and i'm in this field and i've shown stable work and a stable home environment i show that because i'm like a therapist that's one of the fields they'll consider like oh she has the capacity for this or oh she knows the undertaking so i mean there's loopholes so i mean as long as i keep my stuff together and i increase my income bracket to support another child i would be considered i don't necessarily intend to adopt without a partner i just don't know that i need to marry the partner unless like you can for me you can be happy to the extent you guys want to shack up together but I mean, love to me, and maybe I treat it more stringently than other people is, is really an extreme state of being that I think is rarely achieved genuinely. And I need to know that I really feel that emotion with you every fiber of my being to marry, because I think ultimately all marriage really is, is a civil union. You can, if you really mean it on a spiritual level, you just do a shaman, like some kind of shaman thing. You know, you're getting married really because of finances, ultimately, because it's like, I want to know if you die, I'm going to inherit your stuff because I'm your next to kin. Or I want to know if, if you die, the kids, the kids get their stuff. It's really a civil union. So I just don't feel like I can enter, I can attach my whole financial world to you unless we really love each other because I got to trust that you're not going to do some crazy shit. Let's just, all that shit you just said, I'm going to give you the real answer why you don't want to be my, you don't see yourself having sex with one guy the rest of your life. You think so? That's what I think. I don't, I don't think that gets in the way of marriage. Well, anyway. <laughs> I think, I think <laughs> you can still get married. And as long as you guys are on the same page, you guys turn into old 60s. And, uh, and, and about fucking the, the guys, whole uh, therapy uh, adopting children. Like, well, that's first just, of all, the craziest people in the, in the history of men were psychologists. The per- Hitler's the person who uh, fucking started that whole Jewish genocide was a psychologist. That was uh, Hitler's like Ace Boon Kuhn was a psychologist. Hey, stop the- telling. Don't tell the adoption agency the- all of this. <laughs> the person who fucking started, uh, I think it was uh, the whole Jim Crow shit, segregation, he was a psychologist. So psychologists in history have a bad rap but you know but anyway yeah i definitely know that a lot of them have been insane like freud is number one crazy guy but um i mean it just it just depends on the person doing your case in the field but they do consider well, I know that. certain I know. Just, they just, do consider certain fields fact. like stable fields but back to the comment i really don't think honestly it's hard to have sex with the same person i think that if you love someone then like that's all your interests are or at least for me that's how it's been when i thought i was in love i never even had a wandering thought how naturally many, how many times have you been in love naturally i thought twice when i was much younger so you never been in love decisions i don't feel like it was love ultimately because i don't so you never like, been in love i don't think so now because okay. i don't feel like i was in a healthy enough like if you're not yourself you're, like love is something you can a decision you can make because you're you're solid in who you are. I don't feel like I feel like you can think you're in love, but if if you're ultimately not in a mentally sound space, it's not love. It's something else. It can be infatuation. It can be less. It could be a number. Of so things. why did you think you were in love? I thought I was in love because um. I'm going to be honest, I don't typically feel overwhelming emotion for non-family members, and these were two instances where I 
felt emotion to the extent I didn't think I could live without this person. So for me, for them to even evoke any kind of emotion uh, uh, to any extent of that level made me think, oh, wow, this must be love because this is strong and I've never felt this. Mm -hmm. But I think just because things are strong doesn't really mean anything. I think that also if you're making a decision and you don't know who you are or what you're bringing to the table, then how can you evaluate pardon me, who the other person is and what they're bringing to the table if you don't even know who you are. So that's why I think at the time I felt like it was love because it was just literally the most overwhelming emotion I've, I can say I've had to this date. But at the end, neither situation was good for me. And at the end of it, in both situations, I was not mentally sound while dealing with this person and they were exacerbating that unstable mental state. So I feel like... I maybe have a taste for what love could look like if I were mentally sound, because I do think there were elements of those relationships. It's modeled love, but it wasn't love. So do you know yourself now? I think I know myself as, yeah, as well as you can. I think you're constantly figuring, learning about yourself because you're constantly growing, but I think there's a certain state of like equilibrium, you mm -hmm. know, where you know enough to say yes. And I feel like I'm there. I know enough to say yes. That I so, know myself. Who is Taylor Brown? Describe her. Man. Um, dang. I feel like, hmm, the first thing, okay, off tops, I think I'm a creative. I don't say artist. I don't know why, but I think creative fits it better, fits me better. And I think that's like the best description of me. And what I mean by that is like, I literally will just make or build things or figure out how to do things or put things together. Even though I'm a cartoonist and that's my main, I'll try any form of art, even like singing and I can't sing at all. So like I, to me, that's being a creative that I will like indulge in any form of like art building, even like mental thought and thought exercises. So I think that's like the most defining feature I have personally is that I'm genuinely to my core creative. So that's when they say Taylor Brown creator is the only thing that will come after. I mean, that sums you up. In a, that sums you up. I got a, little. I got quick words like yeah, stubborn well, for sure. I'm stubborn as hell. Okay. And um. I mean. Just give me words. You're a creator. She's stubborn. Oh, this was an exercise I had to do recently, and I took so long to think of it. Yeah. One liners for yourself. You know what I mean? Putting your own self into a one liner because no matter how humble you are, you have ego. Like I for sure try to keep myself. Who gives humble. a fuck about what everyone else thinks? I'm asking you, what do you put it who, who is Taylor Brown? I feel like I'm you. stubborn, idealistic, passionate. I'm caring, but I'm a hard ass. I'm not like I'm not gonna show it. I'm one of those wall up type of people. And um I mean I'm goofy and nerdy. That's my exterior, mm. for sure. And that almost maybe masks me being a like really passionate, hard ass, like hyper focused type of person, mm. having that lighthearted exterior. Cues people off my back about how much I'm like obsessing over this thing. I said one liners, Taylor. <laughs> it's hard to describe yourself on the spot. <laughs> I'm trying to give people a concise picture. <laughs> Attempting. Right. That's all you got? That's it. I'm not okay. very complicated. Okay. All right. Well, um, this is a this is a time where you can uh, promote whatever you want to promote. Um, if you want to promote your your happy hour, tell the people where they can find that at. Um, if they want to join one day on your little Zoom, give your Instagram out if you want to do that or. I don't know, shout out your work or just if you have a friend that's throwing a party or whatever the fuck yeah. you want to promote, um, this is your time to do it and go ahead. Um, well, me personally, I'm not working on any projects right now. I leave this summer to collab with people. So what I'd want to shout out is if you guys have projects particularly related to supporting like Black Lives Matter or any of the protests going on, I'd really love if people drop me a line checked out my work, dropped me a line, let me know, you know, some collab ideas, what we could work on. And the best way to get in touch for me is Instagram, which is just at taylor.510. You want to spell that for people? 
Sure, yeah. Just T A Y L O R dot five one zero. Okay. But summers are like, I always leave them open for just collaborative work. And because of Corona, I haven't been able to, to like link with anyone or collab. So that's definitely what I'd like to put out there. And how do people, people get in contact with you? If they want to do your little happy hour thing. If they want to do that, um, I'll actually, after this episode, I will go ahead and post just a general flyer with the, with the general information. But, um, in the meantime, if someone gets a hold of this sooner or is digging sooner, just literally it's one of my first few posts. Just scroll down to any of the old flyers for now, but I'll put some general information in the bio mm -hmm. and like in available up at the top where they can get to it easily. All right. Well, you heard it first. Uh, she's a creative. She's stubborn. She's just Taylor, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, one thing is for sure. She is a beautiful black woman and a force to be reckoned with and the bay area and everyone should look her up support her whatever the fuck she got going on uh support her little happy hour i'm not a drawer so i'm just going to support her through by a distance <laughs> <laughs> but uh taylor thanks for coming on everyday celebrity podcast uh i wish uh big things for you and you have any last words no, I just want to say thank you for having me. It was fun. I like seeing how another artist does their thing. I appreciate the time. All right. And we are out. You.